Um, good morning, everyone. I'm sorry that we are opening the school year under these circumstances. I would like very much to be seeing everyone in person um, in better circumstances. Um, but you know, we are um, hopefully going to learn today in this root of all of the chalalim, the memory of the chalalim, the return of the shvuim, the refuah of the psuim. And we're going to start with some mizmori tehilim, which uh, I I invite you to say together with me. They're here on the screen. We'll start with tehilim yud gimel. I brought two short mizmori tehilim. Lamnatach mizmor le David ad ana adunai tishkacheni netzach ad ana tastir et panecha mimeni ad ana shit etzot benafshi yagon bilvavi yomam ad ana yarum oivi alai habita aneni adunai alohai. Ha'ira enai pen ishan hamavet, hen yomar oivi yecholtiv, sarai yagilu ki emot, vani bechastecha vatachti, yagel libi bishuatecha, ashir al adonai ki gamal alai. Now we'll do a more familiar one. Tilim kuf kaf alef, shir la maalot, esa enai el heharim, me'ayin yavo ezri, ezri me'im adonai, se shamayim va'aretz. Al yiten lamot raglecha, al yanum shomrecha. Hine lo yanum velo yishan shomer Yisrael. Adonai shomrecha, Adonai tilcha al yad iminecha. Yomam ha-shemesh lo yakeka v'yareach balayla. Adonai yishmorcha mikol ra yishmor et nafshecha. Adonai yishmor tzedcha uvoecha me'ata v'yad olam. Okay, so um, the, the, the shiur, I, I don't want to begin the shiur, um, without also offering a tefillah for um, the chayalim. We are, all of us, I think, um, in addition to the pain and the horror of what has happened, we're all of us also worried about the coming days, um, certainly strengthened by the morale of uh, Am Yisrael and our soldiers in particular, but also deeply, deeply worried. And so we offer a tefillah, um, lishlom hachayalim. I personally will share that I have uh, four children in, three sons and a son-in-law. I know many of you here have children and grandchildren and nieces and nephews and cousins and friends and loved ones. Uh, there's, there's um, we all are just all day thinking about the chayalim and their um, success. And Hashem should be with them. ומכל נגע ומחלה וישלח ברכה והצלחה בכל מעשה ידיהם, ידבר שונאינו תחתיהם ויעטרם בחטא הישועה ובעטרת ניצחון, ויקוים בהם הכתוב כי אדוני אלוהיכם ההולך עמכם ויילחם לכם עם אויביכם להושיע אתכם. I will just share with you a personal reflection or maybe a little bit of a personal experience. Since the... Uh, since Hoshana Rava, since really since uh, Simchat Torah. Uh, personally, I haven't been able to give shirim. I have um, been asked by a few people to uh, give shirim, and I haven't really been able to. I've been sort of turned inward, trying to gather my thoughts, seeing uh, you know, when I could, could uh, offer words of Torah to others. Um, obviously, we're all also very involved in lots and lots of volunteer efforts, trying to take care of our our chayalim all over the country and the people who have been evacuated from um, Otef Aza and, and all of the different chesed projects that are going on. And at the same time, it was really very, it's been very hard for me to gather my thoughts. I wasn't sure if I could give this year today. I'm still not entirely sure that I can give this year today, but, um, I'll begin by expressing Hodayat Hashem, Hanoten Liyayef Koach, Harofesh Vurei Lev, 
for giving me yesterday the ability for the first time to sit down and focus and really um, be able to learn Torah. And um, the whole day, what kept going through my head was this pasuk that I brought for you on the screen, Lulei Torah Tcha Azavati Ve'oni. The Torah yesterday gave me great koach, great koach um, and I hope that I'll be able to give some of that koach to you as well. Not everything that I say today will be directly related to the events. In fact, much of what I say, I will not directly relate to the events. Also, this is not gonna be my most organized shiur that I've ever given, but I am gonna offer some thoughts and some reflections that have been occupying me in the last 10 days. Um, and I'm gonna use the parshiot as a prism through which to reflect some of these ideas. Some of these ideas, I hope, the ultimate goal is that they should offer some chizuk, some some comfort, some 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 thoughts, some some ways to reflect. Um, but I certainly don't have the words. I don't presume to have the words to give comfort to each and every person, and not to myself either. But I do hope that um, the Torah itself is a comfort. Lulei taratcha shashuai azavati veoni. These parshiot that we are reading, the one that we read last week, Parshat Bereshit, and the one that we'll be reading this week, right? We're between right now, Bereshit and Noach. I think that these are particularly apt parshiot that teach us how to make order out of chaos, to understand where things go wrong with human beings, to understand what a little bit more deeply our deeply flawed world and maybe also to teach us how we can make it a little more right, how we can rebuild, how we can um, make a little bit of order. Um, Tanakh is a deeply, deeply human book. It's a book about humans. It's a book for humans. It is almost exclusively focused on the earthly world. Now, this sounds obvious to us because we know the Tanakh. But if you look, for example, at Bait Shani literature, they're very, very interested in what's going on in the heavens. They're very interested in God, in, in what he's thinking and what he's doing, right? And, and the Tanakh is much less interested in that. The Tanakh is interested in humans. And in the first parak of the Tanakh, humans are created with Selim Elohim. And I think all of Tanakh is designed to guide us to operate in accordance with our Tzalem Elohim, to find God in our world, in ourselves, in the humanity of others. Rather than finding God in the heavens, we are instructed to find God in on earth, inside of us, in our worlds, in our institutions, in our societies, in our communities, in our life's experiences, we're told as humans to find the Tselem Elohim inside of us, to figure out how we can become a little God-like, to, to, to teach us how a little bit to imitate God, to acquire some kind of God's attributes and, and, and godliness. And that of course requires that we overcome our baser human instincts. The Torah believes in humans' ability to be godlike to have a Tzalem Elohim, and it means a lot of things, but one thing it means certainly based on Bereshi Perak Aleph is that we're meant to be creators. We're meant to use our Tzalem Elohim to build a world. God gives us the infrastructure and we're meant to build a world and that world is meant to be good. It's not enough just to create. Bereshi Perak Aleph tells us that God creates and then he pauses, and then he assesses his creation, vayar elokim kitov, and he checks and makes sure that it is a good world. Now, there's a famous machloket um, between Rabbi Akiva and Ben Azai with regard to which pasuk really kind of sums up the Torah, which is the Klal Gadol, the important principle in the Torah. And famously, Rabbi Akiva says, kamocha. Zehu klal gadol A very important principle in the Torah, perhaps 
Rabbi Akiva is even suggesting that it's the most important principle is you should love your friend as yourself. And Benazai disagrees, is actually presented as a machloket. Benazai says, no, the most important principle in the, to in the, in the Torah, or perhaps if not the most important principle, certainly a more important principle than the one brought by Rabbi Akiva is found at the end of last week's Parsha. In Bereshit, Parakei, Pasuk Aleph, Ze Sefer, Todot Adam. Benazai says, Ze Klal Gadol Mize. This is an even greater statement than you should love your, your, your friend as yourself is this is the book of the genealogy of humans. What, what is this machloket? Right? Fundamentally, I think both of these messages are humanist messages. They're teaching us how to see other people. Rashar Hirsch says, and I think that this is maybe the most obvious point, that the difference is a national and a universal perspective. Shimshon Falher says, why does Benazai say, This sentence that Benazai brings from last week's Parsha is telling us about universal humanism, that it is a basic Torah value to treat humans with respect, not because they're your friend, but because they are humans. Dots Kanim offers a different answer. The Dots Kanim says, and we won't read it inside just to save time, that it's the difference between what actually motivates why we treat other people well. According to Rabbi Akiva, we treat other people well because we see ourselves in other people. Kamocha. You shouldn't do to your friend that which you wouldn't want to be done to you. And Benazai says, no, it has nothing to do with that. You treat other people well because of the end of the pasuk. Let's look at the top of this screen. Ze sefer todot adam biyom bro Elohim adam bidmut Elohim asa oto. Why do you treat other people well? Not because you see yourself in other people, but you treat other people well because they have Selim Elohim, because they are human beings. And that's why you treat other people well. Nevertheless, in spite of the Selim Elohim, which appears so prominently at the opening of the Torah, we see from the Parsha itself that human beings don't often or don't always succeed in seeing others with Selim Elohim, they don't often, they don't always succeed in being the best versions of themselves. It's really extraordinary, I think, that in the first, the first few parshiot of the Torah, the stories of humankind are all about sin. They're all about human weakness. They're all about human failings. They're all about humans giving in to our baser instincts. Don't forget that human beings are created on the sixth day, but it's not a separate creation. They're created on the same day as animals. And of course, many, many Midrashim tell us that's because human beings easily revert to their animalistic behavior, to their base instincts. If they're not focusing on the Tselem Elohim, if they're not focusing on that which distinguishes them from animals, they easily revert back to animal-like behavior. And that's why the Tselem Elohim is such a critical element in the way in which we are meant to interact within the world. And yet, of course, throughout these parshiot, in spite of human failings, God continues to set the bar high and he expects human beings to live up to his expectations, right? And that's really throughout the Tanakh. It's something we see over and over and over. The Tanakh is not just about sin and punishment, right? People always ask me this, why is the Tanakh so filled with sins? And, 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 and it is. But the goal, of course, is that I think that the Tanakh is saying that human beings have the ability to choose. And the ability to choose to sin is also balanced 
by the ability <clears throat> to choose <clears throat> to fix ourselves and to um, and and to, to to stop sinning. And I think that that's part of what these parshiot are about as well. God creates a world, as we said before, that is filled with tov. Right? I brought for you here on the screen Bereshit Perak Aleph. I highlighted the word tov. The word tov appears seven times. The goal of the world is to create a good world, a world that banishes darkness, a world that brings light. And of course, at the end of creation, God sees everything that he did. I'm reading the very last pasuk. It is a very good world. And yet, of course, one of the great anomalies or one of the great questions that arises in Bereshit Perak Aleph is that I brought up for you here in red, when God creates Adam, he does not look at Adam and see Tov. When he creates the light, when he creates the dry land and the water, when he creates the vegetation, when he creates the, the, uh, the, the, the great um, lights in the heavens, when he creates animals, but when he creates human beings, he does not see good. Human beings are not born good. They are born with free will. And that is one of the great gifts that God gives human beings, but it's also one of the great challenges of human beings. And of course, I think many of us are um, aware that the parsha, parshat bereshi, begins with this tov, tov, tov. But how does it end? By yar Hashem ki raba ra'at ha'adam ba'aretz. The whole yetzer machshavot libo rak ra kol hayom. A parsha that begins with tov concludes with ra. Parshat bereshi ends with destruction because of how easily human beings lose their sense of Tselem Elohim, the very thing that distinguishes them from animals. Um, you know, it's not so simple, the idea of whether or not God is gonna create humans uh, set apart from animals by this Tselem Elohim, by this ability to choose whether or not they want to revert to their animal-like instincts or whether they want to strive towards godliness. There's a famous midrash, which I brought for you here. We won't read the whole thing inside. It's a wonderful midrash, which records a discussion between God and his angels about whether human beings should be created at all. The creation of human beings, of course, is not self-evident. And we have uh, four different, um, uh, four different uh, uh, um, kind of, um, uh, reasons why we should or should not create humans, right? So we'll just read here from the middle. Chesed Omer Yivra, right? Chesed says, you know what? You should create humans. Shehu gomel chasadim, right? Because human beings do kindnesses. I don't think, I think all of us have seen this this week. The emet amar al yivra, shekulo shkarim. But truth said, do not create humans because he's filled with lies. Tzedek amar yivra, shehu set dakot, right? Uh, uh, justice or righteousness said, you should create him because he will do many righteous things. Shalom amar al yivra dikulei ktata. But peace says, don't create humans because of course, human beings are filled with rivalries and conflicts. So this Midrash, I mean, you know, we could we could think about it more deeply, but I'm just gonna kind of leave it for a moment as a reflection on what is essentially good and essentially bad about humans. And now I wanna really maybe a little bit more delve into um, a couple, uh, uh, one idea in Parshat Reishit, then we'll turn our attention to Parshat Noah. But, you know, I think this idea that human beings shouldn't be created because they're filled with conflict is perhaps immediately noted in Parshat Reishit as soon as we leave Gan Eden and we have the story of Cain and Hevel, which is about how human beings uh, solve their problems through violence and evil. But what I really want to draw your attention to is that um, the Parashat Reishit really ends 
by presenting two parallel simultaneous genealogies which emerge from Adam Harishon. And these genealogies are actually very, very similar in terms of the names, which, which some of the Parshanim note, right? These are really pretty much parallel genealogies. We have the genealogy of Cain, which is on the right side, who has Hanoch, Irad, Mechuyael, Metushael, and Lemech. And then the final uh, generation has three children. And then we have the genealogy of Shait, who also has a Kayan, a Kenan, and also has an Irad, a Yared, and also has a Hanoch, and a Lemach, and a Metushalach, as opposed to Metushael, right? You see how similar it is, and of course concludes with three children. I think that what's going on here is that the Torah is presenting two options of how society can develop of how the world can progress, of how the world unfolds. According to, it can unfold in accordance with the Kayan line, which is evil and which will die out in the flood, or it can proceed in accordance with the shape line, which will prevail and survive. Okay, this Midrash uh, seems to pick up on this point, Rabbi Ishmael Omer, Mishet, from shape emerged all, all humans and all of the righteous generations. We're going to see later that there's another Midrash that says that therefore Cain's line was completely destroyed. Cain's line is the symbol of evil. What, what, what is the reason? What, what, what is the difference between these two lines? <clears throat> Cain's line disappears because Cain's line is defined by bloodshed. Cain's line is defined by humans who have given up on the Tselem Elohim, who've given up on the idea that other human beings are deserving of dignity and, and, and should be perceived with, um, with, with regard to their godliness. Kayan's line, of course, opens with an act of murder and it concludes with the words of Lemech, which I've highlighted for you here in blue. <clears throat> Lemech here uh, has, sings this song. It's a, it's a little bit of an obscure song, but I don't think it's, it's too obscure to understand its basic idea. Lemech says to his wife, wives, ki ish haragti lefiti v'yeled lechaburati. I've slain a man by wounding him and a child by bruising him. And this boast, this horrific, bloodthirsty boast is the reason that the Kayan line cannot continue. The reason the Kayan line has to be destroyed. And Shadal notes that in fact, um, <clears throat> the, the, uh, the Pasuk before Lemech's boast tells us of Tuval Kayan, Kayan's son, inventing metalworking, right? Lotesh kol choresh nechoshet uvarzel. And Shadal says, uh, Lemech is boasting because his son has invented weaponry. He has used the creative impulse of human beings that God gave them in order to foster evil, in order to foster violence. Lemech sings a song that glorifies violence and killing, murder, power. This is the song of Kayan's genealogy. It's a song, says Rashar Hirsch, that not only do they forget the name of God, it's not that they forget mitziyut Hashem, ela hakavod ha'eloki shel ha'adam. They forget that the dignity of human beings is their godliness. They forget that other people have the tzelem elokim. And so inevitably tells, says this Midrash, all of the Kayan line will be erased. But you've, uh, look at look at what Rabbi Yosho ben Levi says here in this uh, midrash that I bring that I brought for you here. Amar Rabbi Yosho ben Levi, kulhun lashon marduten, 
all of the names on the Kayan line are names that show us how they rebel, irad, and then, then the Bidrash goes in a different direction and, and offers a different etymology of each of these names. Irad or Danani min haulam. His name is Irad, and God says, I will drive him out of this world. Mechuyael mochanani min haulam. His name is Mechuyael. I will erase him from the world. Mitushael metishanani min haulam. His name is Mitushael. I will pluck him from this world. Lamech. Milashon Lama. Lamech's name is why? Mali lelamech uletodotav. Why do I need them? This line is about the evils of human beings. It's about human beings and what they do when they forget the most basic principle of ze sefer todot adam. The shape line, on the other hand, begins with ze sefer todot adam, biyom bra Elohim adam, bidmut Elohim asauto. This is a line which uh, it, this is a, a, a genealogy, which at the last word of each paragraph, we have the word vayamot. We have the recognition of death, of mortality, that that is part of the, 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 the world. And what is the response of shait to death? I mean, Kayan's line is not bothered by death. The opposite is true. His line uses death to wield power, to strike fear in the hearts of others. His response to death is boastful and, and, and he glorifies the use of, of murder in order to assume power over others. What is the response of Shet's line to death? Fertility. Vayoled banim uvano. Okay, um, those are some reflections on the two genealogies that we have in Sefer Bereshit. <clears throat> I will now turn our attention to Parshat Noach. Parshat Noach, of course, is a parsha of destruction, even I would say of uncreation, right? It's, we, we have the, uh, the words that are used throughout Parshat Noach are words that remind us of Bereshit Perak Aleph, but of course, instead of creating the world, we have the uncreation of the world. And of course, at the very beginning of Parshat Noach, we have this perhaps very uh, appropriate, uh, hor horribly so appropriate Pasuk, Vayomer Elohim Lenoach, hates Kol Basar Balafanai. God says to Noach, the end of all creatures has come before me, Ki Malaah Haaretz. Hamas mipnehem, because the world has been filled with Hamas. Vihine meshritam et haaretz, and they are destroying the land. I don't think I have to expand on that. The truth is, is that I'm not really planning to talk about destruction. I'm really planning uh, to use this to talk about rebuilding. As I mentioned, I haven't been able to really. Um, focus very much. I haven't been able to really um, speak in the past 10 days, but I will say that at every shiva call that I've gone to, every funeral, every time my heart has shattered again into a million pieces as we read a different story, of one individual, one individual whose life has been lost, one individual who's been taken hostage, one individual who has been wounded, one idea keeps going through my mind. And that is that the Tanakh and Chazal teach us how to rebuild, how to experience an olam banoi, charev, and banoi. Our parsh, I think, is not really about destruction. It's really about how we rebuild after destruction about human resilience. It's about strength. This is an idea that I think appears in endless Midrashim. It's one of the really, I think, core ideas of Tanakh. It's one of the core ideas that we find in Chazal. And actually, it appears at the beginning of this week's Parsha in an amazing Midrash at the beginning of this week's Parsha, Olam Banui Charev Ubanui. You know, when, when I taught these Parshiot, I assume many people who are on this uh, Zoom were in that class. 
do you remember what I called these partiality? I called the class creation, uncreation, and recreation, which is an English translation of olam banoi charev ubanoi. Now, originally, um, about a month ago, I had recorded the podcast for this week's Parsha, for Parshat Noach, which, which we did not send out because I, I felt that, you know, you couldn't send out a podcast that was made before. It had to be a, a, a podcast that directly addressed the events. And, 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 and yet, one of the things that we talked about a lot was this this Midrash, which, um, which appears at the beginning of our Parsha, it actually picks up on the first Pasuk of this week's Parsha, which has the name of Noach three times. Ela told out Noach, Noach ish tzadik, tamim haya b'dorotav, et ha-Elohim hitalech Noach. Noach, Noach, Noach. I'm not even going to translate the Pasuk. And the Midrash says, why? Do we have the name of Noach three times? Gimel pa'amim b'pasuk lama. And the Midrash explains because there are three Noachs. There's the Noach who saw a world that was built. There's the Noach who saw a world that is destroyed. And then there's the Noach who saw a world that is rebuilt. Those are three different Noachs. Now, the Midrash actually talks about three different people who experience an olam banui, charev, ubanui. The Midrash bases this on a pasuk in Yechezkel, which groups together three seemingly unrelated people, Noach, Daniel, and Eov. What is their connection? Yechezkel, of course, is a book which is written during the period of Chorban. And the Midrash says, all three of these figures saw an olam banui, charev, and banui. Noah saw it in the universal context. Eov saw it as an individual. And Daniel saw it as part of a national tragedy. And all three of these figures had to reconfigure themselves to each different stage that they experienced. We're a nation that knows what it means to rebuild after tragedy. We're a nation that believes in a world that is banoi charev and then banoi again. We're a nation that knows that after luchot are broken, we can get a second set of luchot. We're a nation that knows that the Tanakh does not end with Megillat Echa, that after Echa we have Shivat Zion. We're a nation that knows that after Tzfanya, immediately we have Chagai. Tzfanya is one of the books in Treasar. It's a book that prepares us for the upcoming destruction of Yerushalayim, of the Mikdash. Tzfanya says, Banu vatim velo yeshevu. You're going to build houses and you will not be able to dwell in them because of the upcoming destruction. Turn one page in your Tanakh and you find yourself in Chagai, in Shivat Zion, where Chagai says to the people, Alu hahar v'havetem etz uvnu habayit. Right? Go up to that mountain, bring down some wood, and build a house. We're a nation that when houses are destroyed, we rebuild. We're a nation that knows how to move from the Shoah to the setting up of Medina Israel. We know how to rebuild. We know how to find the strength to recover from tragedy. And we also know the formula for a world that can be sustained. We know that the world can produce bad. There's a pretty well-known Midrash, which tells us that God created worlds and destroyed them, created worlds and destroyed them until he finally created our world. And the Midrash says, why? Why was our world maintained when all other worlds until then God had destroyed? And the Midrash explains, because of the Pasuk, Vayar Elohim et kol asher asa tov me'od. When we are able to create good 
when we're able to fill the world with good, it has reached its potential. It has realized its destiny. And so even though we have the story of the Mabul here in Parshat Noach, which is a story of uncreation, Parshat Noach doesn't end with uncreation. It ends with recreation. And when the world is recreated, it can become, it should become, it must become a better world, right? Um, rebuilding can make us stronger. If it doesn't destroy us, it will make us stronger. It is a, um, a beautiful idea that I heard uh, that the Baal Shem Tov said, where he said that the word sara, which means trouble or anguish, right? When it's rearranged, when the letters are rearranged, it means it, 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 what emerges is so hard. That's in our Parsha, the window of the Teva. Sarah, when it is rearranged, when it's organized properly, it can provide a window of depth and insight into ourselves and into our role in the world. And so what happens to Noah? What does Noah, what does Noah do when he is beginning to emerge from his second stage, from his period in which he finds himself in the Teva. How does he move towards that third stage? So let's look at Noah in the Teva and see if we can understand uh, a couple um, uh, reflections on Noah. We have Noah uh, uh, experiencing the terrible destruction and then in Pasuk Vav, we have here the, the water beginning to recede in Pasuk He. And in Pasuk Vav, Noach opens the window of the Teva. I think that this is a very significant moment. Noach opens the window and he is beginning to look outside of this womb-like ark where he was protected and also helpless. He was reduced to a childlike state, right? He was not uh, a creative um, uh, human. He wasn't building a world. He was just surviving this terrible destruction. And now he begins to make contact with, with the world again. And what, what happens here, I think, is, is, is very um, peculiar because what, what, um, what Noach does is he sends out two birds in rapid succession, right? First the raven and then the dove. And, and, you know, this is really, I think, one of those moments which begs <laughs> to be interpreted, to be, um, to be understood a little bit more deeply. What, what are these, these, these birds? And what is it that Noah is trying to accomplish here, right? So, uh, I mean, you know, there's the obvious idea, which is that the birds are going out to see whether or not the water has gone down, but that actually is, is, is not, is not, clear in the Pesukim. Look at what we have here first in Pesuk Zayn. V'yishalach et ha'orev. Sends out the raven. First thing that Noach does when he opens the window of the Teva is send out a raven. A raven is a symbol of death. What Noach sees when he opens the Teva is a world made for a raven. A raven is a scavenger. He sees a world that is filled with dead bodies. He sends out the raven. That's his first act after the flood. It conveys his own sense uh, that the destruction has been cruel and dark and filled with death. It's a hopeless gesture. And I think it's compounded by the fact that when Noah sends his raven, he doesn't give the raven a purpose. He doesn't give him a job. He sends the raven. He makes his way around the world. He never comes back. This is a world which is divided, which is not united, which has no purpose. This reflects perhaps Noah's nihilistic view of a purposeless world, which is filled with death and destruction. But what happens in the next pasuk? In the next pasuk, Noah sends out the Yonah, the dove, and he gives the Yonah a job. To see, is the water going down? Noah is beginning to make plans. He's beginning to have goals. He's beginning to contemplate the next stage. Can we leave the Teva? 
Can we emerge from this womb-like existence and have some kind of rebirth? At first, of course, lo matza hayona manoach l'chaf ragla. When she first emerges from the teva, it's still a world without calm, without respite. She wants to come back to the inner womb-like world that Noah has created on the teva, and she is welcomed back affectionately by Noah. She says, the time for building, for rebuilding, is not yet there. And then seven days pass. And again, Noah sends the dove. And this time the dove returns with an olive branch. This time the dove returns with a promise of a world that is filled with new growth, stirrings of hopefulness, stirrings of a world that can be rebuilt with virtue and with loyalty. The Yona, of course, is the symbol of loyalty and the, the connection between Noah and the Yona is actually quite, <clears throat> quite emphasized in these psukim, and I think it's really very symbolic. But what happens at that moment when Noah actually opens the ark. Look in Pasuk Yud Gimel. Noach takes off the cover of the ark. And he sees the land is destroyed. But what's Noach's response? Well, he doesn't really offer a response. Noach is paralyzed. Noach can't speak. Noach can't think. He can't move. He can't gather his thoughts. Pretty much where I find myself in the last 10 days, I think where many people find themselves, the Midrash fills it in for us. The Midrash tells us as follows. Rav Huna Amar, Yatsa Mina Teva, Goneach Milibo, comes out from the Teva. And he is groaning in his heart. He's sighing. He is heartsick. He is miserable. He's confused. That's one midrash. Look at this midrash. He said, I will not return to my wife and be fertile again. Because he was afraid. Lest God will destroy again his world. This Midrash notes that Noah emerges without the strength to rebuild, without the strength to repopulate. This is an obvious response to a destroyed world. Where else do we have it? We also have it at the beginning of the book of Shemot in a Midrash that says that Amram divorced his wife and all the men of Israel divorced their wives because they did not want to bring children into a cruel and immoral world of slavery and oppression. And here we have a similar idea. There's a Gemara that tells us that after the Chorban, some people said, we really have to stop having children. Overwhelming destruction breeds a sense of nihilism, purposelessness, it calls into question the meaning and the value of human life. One thing is clear, and that is that in the shot, Noach does not rush to leave the Teva. He takes the cover off of the ark and he is paralyzed until God commands him. Look at what happens in Bereshit, Perak Chet, Pasuk Tevav, Vayidaber Elohim El Noach Limor, Tsei Mina Teva, leave the Teva. Now read the next part that I highlighted in blue. Ufaru viravu Repopulate, rebuild. God calls Noah to leave the Teva. Noah can't do it on his own. And then what does Noah do? This is, I think, uh, 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 for me, always a little surprising. Noach Noah builds an altar. The first thing he does when he comes out of the Teva is he builds an altar and he brings animals. It's 
a little surprising on, on many different levels. I won't get into it too much right now. There is a big question why he now brings sacrifices. Of course, he's been taking care of these animals on the ark for, you know, for, for all this time. Um, you know, maybe he's motivated to thank Hashem for his survival. Um, <clears throat> What, I want to make one point here, and I think it's borne out by what's going to happen right after uh, this this building of the Mizbeach, and that is that maybe Noach's sacrifices here, I've, I've said this before in different contexts, are designed to recognize that human beings and animals are not the same. That human beings have a tzel and elokim, and that animals do not. And as part of this acknowledgement, a couple things happen. One is that God says to Noah, you can eat animals. That is a post-flood um, permission, according to many, many sources. Many sources, and you know, Rashi seems to agree with this as well. It's, it's a Gemara. Tell us that we were created to be vegetarian. We're not really supposed to eat animals, according to Bereshi Perak Aleph. But after the, the destruction, there's a, 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 a strong um, need to state that we are different than animals, that animals do not have a telemelochim. And, and Noah's act of bringing animals as a sacrifice to God perhaps acknowledges this point. Look at, look at what happens at the beginning of Bereshit Paraket. I brought for you. Our, our, our well-known chiastic structure, God instructs Noah as to what he is meant to do now, how he is meant to rebuild the world. And what surrounds this instruction, the outer periphery, the outer circle of this structure are the words pru or vu. Go out and repopulate the world. But what I'm interested for our purposes is B and B. Look at what B and B is. God says to Noah, you, your fear will be on all animals and the animals will be for you. But what do we have in the matching bee? Shofech dam ha'adam. Ba'adam damo yishafech. Ki b'tselem Elohim asa et ha'adam. No man can spill the blood of another because human beings are created in the image of God. Human beings so easily resort to animal-like, instinctive, violent behavior that removes the idea of the Tzelem Elohim. And so here, God tells Noah, you have to build a society that first and foremost distinguishes between animals which do not have a Tzelem Elohim and human beings who value each other because every human being has and is meant to cultivate the Tselem Elohim that is inside of them. When they lose that Tselem Elohim, when, they, when that disappears, that's when they have to be destroyed. That's when the world is destroyed in our Parsha. I wanna, um, for the remainder of the Shior, uh, really look at what happens after Noah emerges from the Teva, but I want to briefly talk about the breed that God makes with Noah, the breed of the rainbow, the Keshet, um, and I'll just make two brief points, and I'll, I'll bring some pretty pictures also. It's nothing prettier really than a rainbow, right? Um, you know, when, when discussing why this is the appropriate symbol of the new breed, um, Rashar Hirsch brings two ideas, and, and I want to share both of them with you. The first thing that he says is, is that there, the breed is, is light that appears, and you can see it very much in this, in this picture I brought for you on the left, light that appears inside dark storm clouds. And this is coming to teach us, read what I wrote, what I, what I highlighted here in red, Sha'afiluk shemidat hadin goveren. That even when God's trait of judgment seems to over overwhelm, mit kayem haolam Hashem. Deep inside of there, we have to know that the world, it prevails because of God's kindness, because of God's chesed, 
after a dark storm, the rainbow emerges painted in these brilliant strokes of color and light. It restores light to a dark world. It's the bringing back of light. It's a symbol of hope and renewal. And what we're really trying to work to achieve in this world. That's the first point that I think that the Parshani make and that I think that is very important. The second point, which I think is even uh, more prominent in the Midrashim and in the Parshanim is that the, the rainbow is a symbol of God's presence. It's a symbol of the theophany, the only place in Tanakh where the word keshet appears not in a military context, because of course keshet means a, a military bow. Um, it is in Yechezkel Perak Aleph, which is Ma'asem Merkava, where, where, where God's presence is, is, is described. The rainbow is associated with God's presence, I think partially because it creates almost this visual connection between the heavens and the earth, this arc of light that, um, that, that, that connects us to, to the heavens. Look at what Rashar Hirsch says here. Achayrim ra'im ota kekeshet ha-mechaberet shamayim va'aretz. The rainbow is there to remind us of God's presence and that um, it appears within the cloud. And the cloud symbolizes not just God's anger, but also God's protectiveness, also God's protections. And so we have this rainbow, which is there to tell us that even after this dark time, light can reemerge and it will reemerge and it will reconnect us to God. And that's, I think, a very hopeful image. And now I want to turn our attention back to Noah, back to the world of humans, primarily the world of humans, focused on the world of humans, which I think is really what the Tanakh is about. How does Noah rebuild? Does he rebuild well or does he not rebuild well? This is a huge question. It's, it's a really, um, I, think, I think we're very ambivalent about what Noah does when he emerges from the Teva? Who does Noah become? Who is the third stage? Who is the third stage Noah? What happens to him? The first thing that we see is that Noah is called an Ish Haadama. Vayachel Noah Ish Haadama. Vayita Karim. Right. So Noah here, he is called an Ish Haadama. He plants a vineyard. For some Parshanim. This seems like a terrible demotion, right? At the beginning of the parsha, what is he? Ish Sadiq, Tamim Hayab Dorotav. He is a Sadiq, and what happens to him at the end? He's an Ish Adama. He's just a person of of the of the ground of planting, and yet, not sure it's so clear that that is a demotion. Don't forget that when Noah is born, his destiny and his name etymology. He's called Noah. Why? This one will comfort us from all of the sorrows of our hands, from the land that God has cursed. Noah's destiny is to become an Isha Adama. And maybe here he is beginning to fulfill his destiny. It's an act of great faith. It reminds us of the dove of the bringing back of the olive branch, of the belief in healing the earth and restarting creation and replanting and pru or vu mil uet ha'aretz of, of, of the fertility of the land. So that's the first point. What's the second point that I think we have to think about? Vayita karem. What is it that he plants? He plants a vineyard, right? And then he becomes drunk. And then the story kind of spirals out of control. And so is this a good thing or a bad thing? When, when Noah plants a vineyard, does therein lie the, 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 the collapse of Noah? Why does he plant a vineyard? And here too, I think it's really important to note, Parshanim are deeply divided about this issue. Vines create wine. Wine is a source of bracha. It's a source of blessing. It can lead to great joy. We're told wine gladdens the heart of humans. One Midrash says that Noah wants to celebrate his survival. Wine symbolizes 
the human ability to improve on the natural world, to create something beyond the natural world. The creation of the vineyard might not be what's wrong. It's do you check and make sure that it's good afterwards? Ayar Elohim Kitov. I want to say one more thing about the wine, and that is that I think that wine can represent even a symbol of how rot and fermentation can produce something great. I think that there's something possibly very symbolic in a positive sense of the, the planting of the vineyard. And yet, of course, it can also be the opposite. You know, of course, we can't forget what happens afterwards, which is really quite, um, quite um, uh, disturbing. Um, there's a midrash, which I'm going to show you uh, here. We won't read the whole thing inside, but it's it's really a, a, a extraordinary midrash where the Satan comes to Noach and says to him, what are you planting? And Noach says, oh, I'm planting a vineyard because I know that, you know, uh, it, it has sweet fruit, whether they're, they're, they're actually fresh fruit, grapes are terrific, whether they're dried fruit, raisins are wonderful, you can make wine from them and that brings joy to the world. And so a vineyard is really a wonderful um, uh, contribution to the world. And the Satan says, I'm gonna help you plant it. Let's do it together. And Noah says, all right, let's do it together. What does the Satan do? He brings all these animals and he kills them under the vineyard. And, he, and the Midrash says, it's a hint that when Noah partners with the Satan to bring wine, he becomes an animal. He divests himself of his Selen Elohim. So what is the wine here? Is the wine a good thing or a bad thing? The wine is something that has potential for greatness and it has potential for terrible things. It's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's a human thing. And then look at what happens to our post-destruction Noah. His son seems to spiral out of control. And he goes out to tell his sons what he has seen. But his other sons display virtue and honor and filial loyalty. And then what happens? Noah wakes up and he speaks. For the first time in the story, Noah speaks. Our pre-destruction Noah did not speak. Our destruction Noah did not speak. Our new Noah speaks. But what does he say? What's his first word? Arur Kanan. Cursed be Kanan. Then he speaks again. What's his first word in his second speech? Baruch Hashem Elohei Shem. Blessed is God, the God of shame. Noach utters curses and Noach utters blessings. Noach understands something profound here, and that is that he must distinguish. Distinguish between bad and good, between the moral and the immoral of humanity. Not all of Noah's, Noah's sons make the same choice. They make different choices. They assume different roles and they lead the world in different directions. Ultimately, look in Pasuk Kafchet, this last Pasuk that I brought for you here from Breshit Perak Tet, Vayichi Noach Achar Hamabu, Shlosh Mel Shana Chamishim Shana. Noach's life is defined by the flood. This is stage three Noach. Noach's life will never be the same. The post flood Noach is not the same as the pre flood Noach. But look at that word, Vayichi Noach. Noach returns to life even after the destruction. So is this a good postscript or is it a bad postscript? Within all the debates among the Parshanim, and they debate about Isha Adama, and they debate about the planting of the vineyard, and they debate about, um, about, about the, the, the sons, and, or I'm showing that there's divide among the sons. 
and there's divide among the way that Noah uses his speech. This is not a good postscript or a bad postscript. This is a human po postscript. This short postscript of the Noah story contains within it, I think, the enormous complexity of what it means to rebuild after destruction, after catastrophe, after an event that changes you completely and utterly, that never allows you to set the clock back, that forces you to create a before and an after, a new reality, a painful new beginning. In this postscript, we see Noah attempting to replant, but then we see Noah becoming drunk in what appears to be an attempt to forget his troubles, but spirals out of control in a negative direction. In this postscript, we see Noah's son become disrespectful and disloyal. Some of the Midrashim say that he castrated his father, preventing his father from fertility, resorting to violence, taking away his father's Selim Elohim. But we see Noach's other sons who respond with virtue and loyalty. We see the raven and we see the dove. We see cursed people and we see blessed people. We see that the world is going to go back to its usual functioning of human beings. When people go back to being people, when Noah emerges from the Teva and brings a sacrifice, God does not continue by saying, Noah, you are ish tzaddik, you are tamim bedorotecha, you deserve praise, you have behaved appropriately, nor does God assume that human beings, when they emerge from the Teva, will have fundamentally changed. Instead, God notes, Ki yetzer leiv adam ra rav, that there is something deeply, potentially evil about human beings. The world will not change. Darkness will follow light and winter will follow summer. God entertains no illusions that after the Mabu, human beings will now be perfect. I, I say this because everyone around me is saying this. Will we finally learn? Can we really change for the better? Can we now become a united society? Can we heal? Can we become strong and loving and good and everything that we know we should be? And the answer is yes and no. No, because people are people and we will always be people and there will always be conflict. Katata. But yes, because we believe in people and God believes in people. And that's why the opening stories in Bereshit and so many stories later are about sin and about Erech about God delaying punishment because he believes in the possibility of doing better, of tikkun, of tshuva, of improving ourselves. The world will go back to its nature. There will be day and then there will be night. This Midrash actually has God asking the question. Amar Kadosh Baruch Hu, Ad matai yehe ha'olam mitnaheg ba'afela tavo ha'ora? Until when will this world be operating with darkness? Let the light come. Ba'yomer Elohim yihi or, and that's when God brings light. Ze Abraham. Ba'yikra Elohim la'or yom. God calls the light day, Ze Yaakov. There will always be people who will bring light. And there will always, always be people who will bring darkness. Night and day. Day and night. But the world can be fixed by human beings. Am Yisrael is created to be an, a nation that brings light. We mentioned before the beginning of Shemot, the birth of Moshe recreates some really extraordinary elements of our Parsha, of, of the creation story. A young boy is born into an immoral, murderous society, which has declared a decree of death upon innocent children. He is placed in a teva, 
in an ark for safekeeping. And his task is to bring the Torah, to bring the or, to bring the light into the world. The birth of Moshe symbolizes the birth of Am Yisrael. It's a birth that is designed to banish darkness and to bring light. When Moshe's mother sees him, she sees that he is good, whatever that means exactly. The Midrash says, how did she see that he's good? People aren't born good. Babies aren't good. She saw that when he was born, the room filled with light. And that's a symbolic idea. It's the recreation of the world. It's the recreation of a world whose destiny is to banish darkness and to bring light. Ha'am ha'uchim b'choshech, says Yeshayahu in Perakhet, ra'u or gadol, this nation, that walked in the darkness, they saw a great light. And one of the Midrashim that talks about an olam banoi charev banoi, I mentioned before that there are many, many Midrashim that address this idea. And there's a Midrash actually on the very first pasuk of the Torah that talks about an olam that is banoi charev and banoi. Let's read it together. Amar Abichia Raba, Mitchilat Briatosha Olam Tzafak, those Baruchu Beit Amikdash, Banoi, the Charev, the Banoi. From the very beginning of the creation of the world, God saw that the Beit Amikdash would be built and then destroyed and then rebuilt. Bereshit Baralokim, Hare Banoi. Because we learn it from the fact that God creates in the beginning. But the world was filled with chaos. The Choshech Apnea Aretz and darkness, Hare Harev, Layom Elohim Yi Or, Hare Banoi. That's the rebuilding. And this Midrash ends with the Psukim in Yeshayahu Perak Samech. Some of, I think, my, 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 my most loved Psukim in Tanakh, these are Psukim that address Yerushalayim, that address Am Yisrael in the aftermath of the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, and these psukim tell Am Yisrael, Kumi Ori, get up and shine your light, Kiva Oreich, because your light has come, Uchvod Hashem Alayich Zarach, and the glory of God, it is shining from you, Ki Neachoshech Yichase Eretz, the world is shrouded in darkness, Va'arafel Le'umim, and there is a cloud over the nations, Ve'alayich Yizrach Hashem, the goal of Am Yisrael, which perhaps we have not yet fully succeeded in accomplishing, is that God's light should shine from us. And nations should walk in that light. And we should be able to teach the world how to create a world that banishes darkness and that brings light. Megillat Echa, which I think many of you know that I spent a long time thinking about Megillat Echa, teaches us how to cope with adversity. And in the very, very center of Megillat Echa, Megillat Echa's central chapter is chapter three. And chapter three is divided into three parts. And the middle part is divided into three parts. And the middle of the middle of the middle, the very core of Megillat Echa, what do we find there? What would you expect to find there? You'd expect to find evil and bad and, and, and pain and adversity. You know what word appears there three times in a row? Tov, tov, tov. Tov la gever kisa o benil rav. It is good for human beings to bear a burden in our youth. Adversity can make us go back to Bereshi Perak Aleph. It can force us to find the good, to find within ourselves the good, to use that to see good in others, and to use that to create a world that we can then look at and say, Vihine tov me'od. This is a very good world. Free choice is a sustained treatise on human freedom, without which the Torah makes no sense. It's God's greatest gift to us. And it's also our greatest responsibility. 
It can be used to find good. It can be used to banish darkness. It can be used to overcome the tohu vavohu that envelops us internally and externally. But to do that, we have to find our Tzalem Arokim and we have to use that Tzalem Arokim to find other people's Tzalem Arokim and to create a world which is Tov Me'od. I conclude with Tfilot for Besarot Tovot, Yeshuot Vim Nechamot, with victory over our enemies, with Rachmei Hashem, Shem Yirachem Al Amo. God should protect our people, our soldiers. God should bring back the hostages, Bishalom. God should cure the wounded. And give us comfort through Torah, Lulei Torah Tchash Ashuai, as Avadi Veoni. Wish you all continued strength, and I wish us all Visarot Tavot.